<laughs> you can sit down. Now, uh, that's certainly a first at a touchstone conference, but uh, if we can double the number of students we have here next year, we can maybe get two proposals, uh, start a tradition. But now, I, uh, she did say yes. I, I said that, but there was too much applause. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, now, of course, I'm going to piggyback on that by trying to get into your pockets a little bit. Um, we need, we definitely need uh, an organization like Touchstone is uh, pretty much a hand-to-mouth organization. We had a board meeting this week, and one of the things that we instituted a few years ago was a, I, I talked to the people who manage our marketing, and I said, look, I want to double our subscriber base as fast as we possibly can. So I said, uh, give me a plan on how we're going to do that. And they came back with a plan, and I said, here's how much it's going to cost. And they said, and I, they said, it'll take five years. I said, can we go any faster than that? And they said, no. And I said, all right, let's do it. And I'm happy to report that we are well ahead of schedule. Um, and when I was talking to the board, uh, so everybody was very happy to hear this. But I, I said, one thing to keep in mind, every subscription we sell, we go a little bit more into the red. <laughs> because we lose money. <laughs> to get a subscriber, actually, to someone to subscribe for $19, uh, or 14 if you subscribe online, uh, then the, you lose all the money on, there's a lot of money you lose on that. Then you've got to get them to resubscribe, then resubscribe again. Once they've done it twice, they're going to stick with us. But it ultimately costs us about $150 per new subscriber to get, keep going. Now these conferences too, that's a big money loser. But we're not, in the business, we're not in the business to make money, we're in the business to do what we're doing here tonight. But as, as it, you probably can tell it, we are completely dependent on uh, donors uh, to get us there. And the, bit, the, the, the group of donors who we just had our dinner that we're most dependent on and most grateful to is the Society of St. James, which is uh, people who donate $1,000 or more a year. You get all kinds of things. You get, we're going to start doing uh, uh, meetings a couple years on, on Zoom. We'll have inside information about talks that we're giving. Of course, you're invited to our annual dinner. And uh, then you get a lot of free things in the mail, like books. And uh, Mady's book, which is the best book we've produced ever, in my opinion, um, is something that comes to all, went out to all society members. And you can, uh, you can become a society member for as little as $85 a month. So um, anyway, think about that. Uh, we've, we've got my long-term goals are to do another conference like this because we get some of our best content from the magazine from these conferences. And it's not just the content for the magazine, but I, I think one of the most important parts of our mission is for you all to get together. I mean, because you all got together, hey, new life is gonna come out of this conference. <laughs> and uh, we are, uh, I, I just wanna, I think that's one of the most important things we could do is more, more gatherings, face-to-face -face meetings. That's why yeah, I think going over the La Quinta and talking is so important. So um, think about becoming a society member. And uh, anyway, with that, I'm going to, I'm sorry? Oh, Father Wilbur, invite Father Wilbur up. You stand with me as we pray and sing to the Lord. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for the Lord hath wrought wondrous things. His right hand and his holy arm have wrought salvation for him. The Lord hath made known his salvation in the sight of the nations, hath he revealed his righteousness. He hath remembered his mercy to Jacob and his truth to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Those revelations have come to us in creation, in the faithful work of God throughout all of the history of salvation, supremely in the incarnation, the sacrifice of Christ, the resurrection, Pentecost, 
And so that we say truly in the church, the Lord is in our midst. In many ways, he's always coming. And so we celebrate tonight a song that you, I almost can guarantee, will not sing for a while. And I will warn you because I don't want anybody to be too taken over by surprise and laughter. We're going to sing tonight, Joy to the World. Let us pray. O oh Christ our God, we give thanks beyond our expression that we can make of our gratitude for the magnitude of what you have done to bring to us not only the order and the fullness of creation, the unspeakable grace and mercy of creating us in the likeness in the image and likeness of God. For coming to us in the Holy Spirit, the comings, the comings, the comings. And so, as we are in this conference, whose theme is the first word, crisis, we thank you that the king of all authority is in our midst in our lives, and in your world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. No lower let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes in. His blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace, and may the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Where two or three are gathered, there is Christ as we gather in his name. We are all members of the one body. And we help each other, <laughs> truly. Uh, back in 1986, when Touchstone first emerged, was born as a little newsletter, uh, Tom Buchanan was there, uh, Dr. Tom. He was, I guess he was the, uh, the obstetrician there, but uh, <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom was there. Um, Steve Keller was one of our board members was also there, I was there. Um, it was a collaborative effort. Um, within a year, I met our next speaker, Father Patrick Henry Reardon. We were just kind of struggling along, but he came along and started providing 
some really contentive uh, articles. Um, he's a fantastic writer, fantastic biblical scholar. Um, he's been pretty much almost from the ground floor with, uh, the, with the magazine. Um, right around the same time, Steve Hutchins came along. Steve is here in the audience. I think he's not sure where he's sitting, but um, he's been here. Yeah, way in the back there. Um, I say this just to say how important we are to each other and no one single personality or, uh, within, within the body of Christ. And that's something I've really learned from working with these men, uh, now working with Doug and, and so many others. We are all in this together. And I want to just pay tribute to Father Pat's uh, influence right from the beginning uh, with Touchdown. And since then, he became our pastor of our parish. He's now the pastor emeritus of All Saints Orthodox Church in Chicago and the author of many, many books. Um, his education includes, uh, many decades ago as he says, uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, St. Anselm's College and the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome and St. Tikhon's Orthodox Seminary in Pennsylvania. He also taught at several colleges, two seminaries over the years, pastored congregations in Florida, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, and Illinois. He's published 11 books and numerous articles, reviews, editorials, and uh, several journals. Um, I've, I find him to be a scribe, a scribe of the kingdom. He's taught many of us much from the word um, to see Christ in the Psalms title of one of his books which if you haven't read it you don't have it get it so without further ado I'd like to welcome Father Patrick Henry Reardon to speak to us Several years ago, I was talking with uh, Doug Johnson. He mentioned to me that the second song was his favorite song. It's also one of my favorites. It's among the psalms, the several psalms I would not willingly omit from daily prayer. But I thought it was something special that Doug took that as his favorite song. And when I inquired about it, it's, when it's, it's his favorite song for one of the reasons it's one of my favorites. So it's the exact same reason. It has to do with the world in which we live in which the, the populi meditati sunt inania, as it says, the peoples are meditating on inanities. In, inania, populi meditati sunt inania. In Christian literature, this psalm is first quoted in the prayer of the church in Acts 4. Remember the, the, the arrest of Peter John, they pray the psalm, and then they, then they, then they move on through the psalm okay. to talk about creation and how God has made all things and deposited them in, in the hands of his Christ, and then suddenly you get this sur surgence of resistance within the world. It's very clear, Luke was very struck by this. In, in fact, you'll see that reference there in, 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 in um, chapter four of Acts. He refers again to the Pontius Pilate and Herod, people who, two men who had been at, at, at odds. They come together at a conspiracy. You know? 
and, and Luke says in his gospel that, that Pilate and Herod had not been friends before. Jesus brought them together. I was so glad to hear in last night's opening lecture a reference to Psalm 1. But the, but the rooting, the rooting of authority already in the law of God and, and uh, the, the just, uh, Rusty Reno made that, made, made that point. I said, boy, this is, this is marvelous. The theme is Psalm 2, but he went back to Psalm 1 and, and that's right, that's right. You see, Psalm 2 is the politicizing of Psalm 1. Take, just, just start Psalm 1. There is the man, Ashurah Ha'ish, the blessings of the man. And it's a man, it's the male, by the way. It's an heir in, in, in the Septuagint. It's the rear in, in the Vulgate. It's not, not, not a human being. This is the man. Well, of course, I, I agree with Augustine that ultimately it's the, 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 the homo dominicus. It's, this, this, it's, it's Christ himself. But let's start, let's start more modestly. Psalm 1 is not a prayer in the usual sense as much as there is no direct address to God. It is rather a meditation. Here I am pretending to be able to see the, my manuscript. Just, uh, you get this way after a while. You know. <laughs> I, I feel confident I'm the oldest person in the room. And it's not, that's not the case. I, I've, I've been the oldest person in every room I've been in for quite some time. <laughs> Someone is a meditation on a wisdom theme. How the righteous man lives and what he hopes for. The affirmations of this psalm are made in the calm, apodictic style of Proverbs and the Bible's older wisdom literature. You might notice that the, the, the first line is triadic. Normally the couplet is, the, is, your, is your, your form of, of getting through the psalms because it's, it's like walking. You, you walk you, line by line. And you mean in twos. So when, but when, when the psalter becomes tripodic, you don't walk, you settle down. Notice, for example, this Psalm 1 is, is, is tripodic in its first line. Also for Psalm 3, Psalm 3, which is always the, fir always the first lo uh, line of the psalter in the prayer of the church. That's in the, he in the Hector Psalmos in the east and the rule of St. Benedict in the, in, in the west. You begin with Psalm 3, which is also tripodic but I'm not gonna talk about Psalm three tonight. It's the form of this, of the Psalm in Psalm one is given by the wisdom literature. Its matter is from the early pages of the Torah. Who after all is this man of Psalm one? Well, to begin with, he is the first man of the Torah, righteous Adam, man before the fall, when he was still God's friend. As Adam tilled the garden irrigated by the four rivers, the man in Psalm 1 is likened to a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth this fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. You might notice this triadic again in, the, in that line. Of the man described in this psalm, we are told that his delight is in the Lord's Torah, and on his Torah, he meditates day and night. The day and night of the psalm are also introduced, we recall, at the beginning of the Torah. And so forth. The most basic divisions of time. During all that time, the righteous man is meditating on the law of the Lord. In contrast to the stability of this godly man 
Psalm 1 speaks of the rashaim, uh, the wicked. Not so the wicked. Not so. The wicked are likened, as Dr. Reno reminded us last night, are likened to the shaft which the wind drives away. Just as the former does not sit in the path of sinners, pardon me, stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the pestilence, so the rashaim shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Okay. There's, the, there's your introduction to the whole Psalter. Then Psalm 2, which is the psalm of this, gives the theme for this conference, is the Messiah. In Psalm 2, Adam becomes David, so to speak. This man is transformed into the king, the Mashiach, the anointed one. And you'll notice that in Psalm 2, the pace of the Psalter dramatically quickens because something's afoot. What's afoot? Well, there's a conspiracy afoot against the Lord and against his anointed. It moves from the calm meditation of wisdom to the robust narrative of conflict. Here, the Torah and the wisdom literature are replaced by the former prophets, particularly the Samuel King's saga. Likewise, the contrast between good and evil in Psalm 1 grows into the conflict between good and evil in Psalm 2. The Rashaim, the evil in Psalm 1, become the conspirators of Psalm 2. Open rebellion is afoot. If the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For this reason, the style of the Psalter moves from the apodictic declaration in Psalm 1 to the energetic inquiry in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? And the people conspire together, or as it says in the in the in the um, in the Septuagint, and in the uh, and in the Veda, in, in the Vedas Latina in the, the, the Gallic and Psalter, uh, meditatis suntanani, the meditative vain things. As the ungodly in Psalm one were a shaft, as the wind drives away. So in Psalm 2, you shall break them as a rod of iron, with a rod of iron, you shall dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 2 introduces politics. There's so much I want to say about politics in the Bible, um, but I'm not going to say it tonight because I've already used probably half the time I'm allotted. The historical goal of history, what other kind has a historical goal, is the gathering of all the kings of the earth in the worship of the true God. Other than that, what the Bible has to say about the political order, there's no order to it at all. It's impossible to do any kind of synthesis of this at all. You can't do it. Um, they, the Bible doesn't, the Bible gives a bunch of conflicting views about, about the political order. It's, it's, a, it's a house where there's a thousand doors, in, but none of the rooms seem to get connected. Right. I want to open one door into the house tonight. It will not lead us to all the rooms because it's not that sort of house. The sign on the door says, Iran and Israel. I thought I'd get your attention. I told, I told Alan the other, the other night we had supper. I said, I'm going to talk about the relationship between Israel and Iran up to 530 BC. <laughs> but I thought I couldn't do anything else. After reading Rod's, Rod, Rod Dreher's a column yesterday morning is his, his, his Substack. I, I always read everything. I read everything Rod writes. This evening, I, I do want to begin by speaking about Persia and its historical relationship to the people of God. And this will fall, fall I think, right out of what I've said about Psalms 1 and 2. 
It's truly remarkable that the first time God speaks of a Persian ruler, he compared the Persian ruler to David, the father of the Messianic dynasty. Ko amar Adonai lim shicho vakheretz asher hechazati bimimi bimin bimino. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, lim shohi, to his anointed, Cyrus, whose right hand I have taken, Isaiah 45.1. In the previous chapter of Isaiah, Israel's God says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and all my desire he shall fulfill. He's talking about a pagan king. Yeah. And to say of Jerusalem, it shall be built, and of the temple, it shall be founded. As David planned the first temple as the Lord's Messiah, so Cyrus plans the second temple. Neither king lived to see either temple built. Perhaps the extraordinary distinction accorded to Cyrus by these references is set in greater relief if we recall that the Hebrew word for anointed, Messiah, in its Greek is Christos. And that when God speaks of my anointed in the Old Testament, his reference is to David. I prepare a lamp for my anointed. You know that it's Psalm 132, unless you use an orthodox psalter based on the Septuagint, in which case it's 131. The designation of Cyrus as my shepherd, again puts us, the attentive reader, in the mind of David. Who then was this Cyrus, of whom the Lord God speaks in these messianic and covenant terms? Cyrus II of Anshan, an ancient country within the territory of modern Iran, that lay to the northeast of the Fertile Crescent, just under the Caspian Sea. After the fall of Nineveh in 612, Anshan, traditionally subject to the Assyrians, became a vassal state of the Medes. In 550, its king, Cyrus II, defeated the Medes, thus becoming ruler of the entire empire of the Medes and Persians. I touched on this several years ago with a, one of my columns called Two Views of Persia and how the Bible's view of Persia differs profoundly from the view of Persia you have in Greek literature. The, the, the Bible takes a very rather dim view of the Greeks, but a rather positive view of the Persians. In order to gain this ascendancy, Cyrus had accepted the help of the Babylonians, who apparently did not reflect that a victorious Cyrus would soon prove to be a greater threat to them than the Medes ever had been. When their new danger did finally dawn on the Babylonians, they promptly formed a defensive pact with several countries, including Lydia, a kingdom situated in the west of a large peninsula we now call Turkey. Before challenging Babylon, therefore, Cyrus determined it would be better to conquer Babylon's ally, Lydia. I'm not going to go through all that. You'll just go back and read the first book of Herodotus. It's all, it's all there, the first book of Herodotus, which ends in 530 with the death of Cyrus. I'm going to skip about 10 pages of this. Okay. The fall of Lydia struck panic among the Greeks. That's all referred to in, in Isaiah 41, verses 5 and 6. The Greeks quickly realized that they too would have to face the growing of Persian Empire. The panic of the Greeks, however, was nothing to that of the Babylonians. They knew they were next on the list of Cyrus. To the Jews, however, the recent victory of Cyrus over Lydia augured their own deliverance so they watched his military progress with no little excitement. Just, just read Isaiah 41. Just, just place yourself in there. Between, see, see between, oh, 547 from that point on. And to start with, with um, 
So we'll just start with the second part of Isaiah, the first chapter, start with chapter 40. Over and over it is really told not to fear because God was about to deliver them from the Babylonians. That's a major theme. It has to do with, has to do with this pagan king, Cyrus, who is unwittingly, he's, he's a decent man. He's, he's, not, he's not like the Babylonians, but he's not, he's not a believer in the Lord, but the Lord uses him. They did not have to wait very long. On October the 13th, 539, Cyrus captured Babylon by a shrewd tactical maneuver, immortalized in, in military and history. And that's all in, covered in detail in Herodotus. As we know from a record Cyrus left to posterity, an inscription on a clay barrel called the Cyrus Cylinder, this Persian ruler of Babylon promptly proclaimed himself a servant of the Babylonian sun god, Marduk. The Bible, nonetheless, Cyrus is ever regarded as the historical instrument of the true God, Israel's God. It was Cyrus who brought the Babylonian captivity to an end in 538, authorizing the return of the chosen people to their homeland. Along with the restoration of the sacred vessels of Jerusalem's temple, which he ordered to be rebuilt. Father Andrew has been preaching on the book of Ezra for several weeks now, a couple of months, I think. Um, but that's all covered in Ezra and in Second Chronicles. In the history of the Christian church, the most obvious parallel to Cyrus, I think, was Constantine, it seems to me. What the latter did for the Christians is readily compared with what the former did for the Jews. Much of what we know of Constantine is in fact comes to us through two works of Christian historian Eusebius, the life of Constantine and the panegyric of Constantine. Constantine conquered all of Rome on a campaign fueled by religion. Constantine helped Christianity to be recognized as a legal religion within the Roman Empire after, suffering, after the church had suffered persecution from Rome's early pagan rulers. I've got, well, let me just, I don't want to take all of that. Both Cyrus and Constantine conquered many cities during their reign. What was their political and religious policies that marked a major advance in the study of man's history and his relationship to God? But by building, seeing to the seeing to the building of the second temple, this this pagan king, he transformed Judaism. Um, because this is the temple that was going to receive the Messiah. And the church certainly has not been the same since the time of Constantine. The policies of these two men allowed people to speak their own languages, practice their religions, their own way of life. Their toleration towards the people they conquered contributed to the advance of Judaism and Christianity. Okay. It's the first fruits, it's the first fruit as it were, of what we hope for at the end of time and the fulfillment of history, when all of the kings of the earth assemble, like the kings in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, assembling with their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh, and all of their philosophy and all of their history and all their scholarship and all their, all their culture, come lay it all at the feet of the Messiah. Amen. Okay, a little behind, but uh, that's all right. For our last speaker for this evening, um, last year, uh, I know many of you were here, 
and heard Hans Borsma's powerful talk. And uh, we had an editor's meeting later, about a month after this, and discussed what we were going to do this year and possible speakers. And Hans was adamant that we had to invite Adam McLeod to speak. He said he spoke at a conference that he attended and commanded the room. And I checked it out, and this talk, and I uh, liked it so much we printed it in Touchstone. It was called, we titled it The Unreal Vortex. Uh, and refers to, he begins with a, a metaphor of a tornado uh, that wreaks destruction, but similar to how Michael Hamby discussed it, there is nothing in, in the tornado. It, it is a, 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 a void, a low pressure. And what you see is not the tornado, it's just the destruction it wreaks. And it was a brilliant metaphor uh, that he went on to discuss. But uh, so we were, we liked it so much, we thought we'd had to have him here at, uh, at this year's conference. And I'd like to introduce Adam McLeod is a professor of law at St. Mary's University and research fellow of the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy. He's a co-editor of Christy Martin's Jurisprudence. He has offered, authored three other books, dozens of scholarly articles, more than 100 essays and book reviews, opinion pieces, in the Washington Post, Washington Times, National Review Online, and local newspapers, amicus curiae briefs in the US Supreme Court and state Supreme Courts. He has been a research fellow at Princeton University and George Mason University, and a special deputy attorney general of Alabama, and a law clerk to state and federal judges. He currently serves as a trustee of the American Anglican Council and as a legal staff officer in the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. Please welcome Adam McLeod. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. Thank you for the warm welcome. I'm going to start a little earlier than 530 BC um, with a story that's very familiar to you. So I'm going to pick up toward the end. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. And then, lo, Adam spake up and saith, like, that's just your opinion, man. <laughs> the essentialist assumption that fruit always comes from seeds is just a product of your arbitrary discursive regime. <laughs> Such a rationalistic way of thinking is an historical contingency. Reason triumphed over madness by power and violence. But reason cannot account for the full range of human experiences. Science and reason are discursive regimes created by man to have a political status. In fact, in the archaeology of our thought demonstrates that man is an invention of recent date. Before the artificial identities and differentiations of your so-called creation, there was only similitude and semblance, the same. All these differences, night and day, light and darkness, land and sea, male and female, they're just discursive constructs that you use to assert power over us. Oh, you haven't heard that part before. <laughs> then lo, Eve chimed in and saith. That's like such a patriarchal thing to say. <laughs> the assumption that there is a unitary male or female experience is totally flawed by its essentialism and its cis-patriarchal heteronormativity. Words as such do not refer to anything outside of ourselves, certainly not to objective truths. Only individual expression has any meaning. Your discursive practices are not entitled to the privilege of defining my experience. In fact, your categories are just as oppressive and contingent upon the subversion of authentic personal identity. Sex and gender depend upon a performative activity that you coerce out of the other. They're not real in some objective sense. 
Because the reality of my subject is defined by my lack of your signification. My gender is contingent upon your recognition and affirmation. And for you to refuse to affirm my gender is for you to cause me harm. <laughs> then God saith, on second thought, maybe I'll put the elephants in charge. Now, if the latter part of this dialogue sounds familiar to you, maybe you should call your office, because you're probably an American lawyer. <laughs> A generation ago, critical theorists moved into the mainstream of law schools and legal academic discourse and took up residence there. They now dominate legal discourse and advocacy in the United States. A large share of American law professors, lawyers in elite law firms, and public officials who hold law degrees now either espouse or accept the basic dogmas of post-structuralist ideology. Pick up any law review article or an amicus curiae brief in a landmark Supreme Court case at random, and you're more likely than not to encounter one or both of these dogmas. The first dogma is that law has no essential connection to reason. There are no rational bases for the law, and there are no binding reasons within the law. Law is not a reason for our choices and actions. Law is instead a kind of discursive regime arbitrarily constructed out of cultural, social, and economic power to define out of existence the subjective experiences and thus the only true realities of those who lack such power. The second dogma is that language has no true meaning. Language is not the vehicle by which legal meaning is transmitted from one rational human being to another. Language cannot coordinate our discourse toward mutual understanding, nor can it coordinate our actions toward a common good, because language does not refer to anything outside of itself. There is no correspondence between the signifiers of any language and truths that language might signify. Language is a never-ending play of signifier sliding over signifier, with no determinable relation to any extra linguistic reference at all. Those in power manipulate this indeterminacy of language to control what people say, and thereby to control what people think. Now, fidelity to these two dogmas is increasingly used as a litmus test for access into academic discourse about the law. Now, today, to apply for appointments to several elite law faculties or to submit an article to some elite law journals, one must first provide a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement which signals adherence to or at least submission to one or both of these dogmas. This is a problem because, of course, law faculties are the gatekeepers to the legal profession. And because the law schools are committed to this post-structuralist ideology, the lawyers who graduate from law schools are increasingly enslaved to it. Now, I don't mean by this that the lawyers are aware of their ideological enslavement. I found that most of my colleagues in the legal academy have not read Foucault, Lacan, or Derrida. But many of them have read their American disciples, Duncan Kennedy, Richard Delgado, Robin West, Kimberly Crenshaw, Cheryl Harris, and Angela Harris, who are the founders, respectively, of critical legal theory, dominance feminism, critical race theory, queer theory, and intersectionality theory. But the poor French post-structuralists have the misfortune to be adored and imitated by American law professors who somehow manage to be both less subtle and less candid and interesting than their intellectual fathers. Indeed, it is precisely American law professors' lack of understanding of their own ideological commitments, of the inability of power relations to explain most human motivations and actions, and of the existence of alternative ways of thinking about the law that makes their ideological enslavement so thorough and complete. Now, I trust that in this room, it's not necessary to explain why these two dogmas are inherently incompatible with the rule of law. You can't have, you can't have post-structuralist ideology and the rule of law. You have to choose. I've made that argument elsewhere in the pages of uh, Touchstone and other places. Here's the short version. 
Lawyers who adhere to these dogmas cannot uphold the law as something above the powerful, as we are sworn by oath to do, because lawyers who adhere to these dogmas cannot conceive of law as anything other than power. To think of law as a practical reason, independent of power, one must first think of law as having an essence, the great heresy of post-structuralist thought. There has to be an essence to law, a core reality by reference to which all weak, derivative, and defective instances of law can be compared. To have law, we must have law teachers who are capable of understanding, perceiving the difference, the essence of law, by the exercise of theoretical reason. To understand the purposes of law from the perspective of practical reason, and to communicate the law's uh, meaning using the gift of language we then must act according to the reasons that they teach us. That's what's needed to have the rule of law. It must be law that motivates our practical reasoning and not merely our fear. It must be something that directs us toward a common good and not merely away from the threat of sanction or injury. I'm here tonight to tell you that the situation is far worse than you can possibly imagine, but not as hopeless as you might think. Three points. First, I'll discuss why concepts of law matter. To be sure, the practice of law also matters. We need to be able technicians of the law to litigate the right cases, using the right strategies, and the best considered arguments at the right moments. But concepts of law determine what is possible in legal practice, because they determine what lawyers can think. And so, concepts of law define the boundaries of what we're able to achieve in the law. In particular, the rule of law depends upon our acceptance of one basic truth. Second, I'll explain that because our legal educators rejected that truth a century ago, we've already lost the rule of law in principle. That loss is now working its way out in practice. And then third, I will conclude by sketching a way out of the mess that we're in. In short, I want to talk about how we lost the rule of law and how to get it back. Now, the rule of law is one of the great achievements of Christendom. It was made possible by one simple idea. Non-lawyer Americans, fortunately, are still accustomed to taking this idea for granted, but it was radical and even unlikely when it was articulated 1,400 years ago. Indeed, that lawyers are losing hold of this idea today, at the very moment when human knowledge is so vast and accessible to most of the world, proves just how fragile and contingent the rule of law is in the course of human history. The basic idea on which the rule of law is constructed and without which we cannot sustain it is that law is essentially something other independent of mere power. Law is not the will of the sovereign. It is not the threat of sanction. It is not economic coercion or cultural coercion or gendered coercion or religious coercion. Power may be necessary to make the law work in marginal cases where practical reason breaks down and lawlessness threatens to prevail. But power is a tool of the law, not its source or essence. The essence of law is not found in violence or coercion. The essence of law is located within our capacities to understand deliberate about and communicate practical truths about what is just and therefore what is right to do. So in its essence, law is a reason for our actions. Law acts not primarily within our passions, fears, and appetites, but rather within our minds. Law motivates us as rational creatures, creatures who in the language of the tradition bear the image of God. Bears and wolves do not negotiate contracts or filibuster legislation. Codfish and lobsters do not argue about who bears the burden of proof. No non-human creatures make and obey law, and all human beings have the capacity to understand law. This means that law is not the exclusive prerogative of the guy with the biggest biceps or the largest pile of gold. The true sense of human equality is that we're all equal participants in and subjects of the law. No person is above the reach of the law's governance, and no person is beneath the reach of its reasoned justifications. No one may flout the law. No one may make the law whatever he wants. 
and everyone deserves an explanation for the law. We must be prepared to explain why our laws and our judgments are valid reasons for obedience. This is what we owe each other in justice. And this is the basic idea of Western jurisprudence. It is the foundation of the rule of law. And because it has made possible the rule of law, this idea made possible civic trust, investment and creativity and risk-taking, free trade and commerce, trusts and corporations and charities, education and the arts, and all the other fruits of civilization that we enjoy. Now, this idea, it must be said, leaves ample room for jurisprudential pluralism. Law can be many things as long as it is not merely might-making right. The just must make right, and the right must be just whether it is settled settled as a matter of natural justice or legal justice. Indeed, not all law must come from the same source. Some laws may be strictly necessary as a matter of natural reason, like the duties of parents toward their natural children and the inalienable right to life. Other laws are conventional, like the customary rights of trial by jury and freedom of the press. The crucial proposition to maintain is that law is not whatever the most powerful people say it is. The patron of this idea, and therefore the grandfather of the rule of law, was the emperor Justinian. His corpus juris civilis synthesized Roman law, natural law, and the justientium, the law that is common to all civilized nations. Justinian's jurists first described in detail the artifacts of Western law as artifacts independent of power, both Roman civil law and the justientium, which is shared by all civilized people, as creations of the human mind and artifacts of human acting and making. The laws we have are laws not merely because the Senate or emperor said so, but because they are the means that persons have devised to enable us to achieve justice, to do what is right with respect to other persons. They accord with practical reason. They are intelligible, logical, and rationally related to valuable human ends. And they are made things, discernible objects of human knowledge. They exist independently of sovereign will. We can study them, learn them, obey them, and hold others accountable to obey them. The jurists had on hand a compelling and vivid illustration of this separateness, priority, intelligibility, and enduring nature of the law. And they began the digests by describing it. It was the Roman 12 tables. After the early Romans abolished the monarchy, they briefly wallowed about in chaos and rule by mere custom before they appointed 10 men to exercise the authority of the state to put their laws in writing on ivory tablets and to display them for public view. Thereafter, those who would rule or render judgment were obligated not to exercise their own discretion, but instead to act in obedience to a correct interpretation of the law. They were obligated to reason together and to connect their judgments rationally to legal texts so that all could consider whether they were exercising legal judgments or mere power. By placing the 12 tables above those whose job it is to interpret and declare their meaning, the early Romans placed power under the law. Power is under law insofar as it is governed by reason and word. And the reasoning of those entrusted with the law is open for all to examine. Their legal power must remain for a people who are governed by law rather than by the biggest biceps or largest pile of gold. Power is certainly part of the law, and that sometimes makes it effective, but it is not law's essence. When Justinian's jurists write about power, they describe it as something contingent upon and created by laws rather than the other way around. The natural power that is common to all persons is liberty. All other powers are artificial. All men are born free, they tell us. For this reason, Justinian's jurists insisted that slavery is contrary to natural law, a revolutionary idea in the sixth century. The power of a slave owner is therefore an artificial creation of the justientium, contrary to nature, 
made in response to wars and conquests to provide an alternative to mass slaughter. Other powers also serve the ends of law and are derived from law. The power of a guardian over his ward is a product of civil law, and the guardian is bound by duties to protect and defend the ward, which duties are defined by law. A praetor can confer rights to possess goods, but he cannot make an heir because he cannot defy the legal authorities from which his power is defined. Indeed, all the public offices are creatures of the law, made to serve the ends of the law. And so the jurists ask rhetorically, quote, what advantage is there in the existence of law in the state if there are not officers to conduct its administration? In these ways and many others, Justinian made it possible to think of law and justice as something independent from and prior to power. Human actions, including the actions of the most powerful, are judged by an external standard that is partly conventional but not contingent upon power itself. Law is not made right by power. Power is made right to the extent that it is authorized and governed by law. Furthermore, the civil law itself is under a higher law. Not all the laws are human artifacts in Justinian's account. Some laws are settled and fixed prior to and independent of all conventions. The laws of nature, we read in the Institutes, which all nations observe alike, being established by a divine providence, remain ever fixed and immutable. The authority of such laws is not contingent upon political sovereignty. Indeed, it does not depend upon any human volition. And one need not be a legal specialist to interpret this natural law. Throughout the corpus, the jurists refer to legal doctrines that are required not only by civil law, but also by, quote, natural reason. As later jurists who built upon the Justinian's doctrines observed, natural reason is God's gift to all who bear his image. Now, both the Institutes and the Digest identify law with right and justice. This is another revolutionary idea. Indeed, Justinian's jurists use the same word, jus, to refer to the lawful, the just, and the rights that are owed to persons. Note well, law is not contrasted with rights and justice, a contrast that many elite legal scholars draw today. Nor is it associated with legislative will, executive force, or judicial jurisdiction. Law, right, and the just are all in the same family and working in the same direction. Now, some rights are universal, required as a matter of natural justice. The truth of the universal right not to be killed intentionally is not contingent upon human power or convention, much less on the assent of a sovereign political. Laws that secure the right to life, as by imposing criminal sanctions on murderers and refusing enforcement to transactions whose purpose is death, are strictly required as a matter of natural practical reason. So laws that prohibit murder rest on an authority of natural reason itself, with or without any positive enactment. Justinian's jurists thus uncover the universal principles within the law that reconciled law to the just and to the right. In the Institutes, we encounter the revolutionary claim that slavery is contrary to natural law. In the Digest, we learn that the natural law teaches us the union of man and woman that we call matrimony. And we find that the edict that a man is to be judged according to the like rule that he's caused to be applied to another, an edict of perfect justice. Throughout the entire corpus, we encounter an extended demonstration that the law of nations and the civil law of the Roman Empire are partly determined and therefore authorized by the universal requirements of practical reason. Theft is wrong everywhere. The seas and navigable straits are inherently common resources everywhere. A lesson one nation in particular is forgetting at the moment. The natural family, mother, father, and the child born of their union is the first juridical entity in any political community prior to positive enactments everywhere. To be sure, most questions of justice are not of that sort. On most of the practical questions that confront political communities on a daily basis, there is no uniquely right answer. What should be the marginal tax rate for a merchant who earns 122 denarii per year? I don't know. Someone has to decide the question. It's a matter of human choice to be settled by human conventions. 
These are the questions that Aristotle called matters of indifference, that the Christian philosopher Aquinas called determinatio. Political communities must have answers to these practical questions as well. But most practical questions can be settled and specified in different ways consistent with reason. So what's the solution? Well, we have legal authority. And once the questions have been answered by that authority in law, obedience to those answers is itself now a requirement of justice. Following St. Paul, Aquinas, and the other jurists affirmed that obedience to law is an obligation of conscience. But not all communities within a political community must have the same laws. Law is essentially reason rather than power or coercion, and practical reason directs us toward a variety of human goods. The good of the family business is not the good of, or the same as the good of the Walt Disney Corporation, a fact that's been illustrated vividly in recent weeks. The good of the engineering college is not the same as the good of the liberal arts college. And this is why, in a healthy political community, private law is, primarily, uh, is, is primary, while the public law takes a back seat. Indeed, a mark of a healthy political community is the proliferation of private laws and the stable simplicity of public laws. And conversely, one of the first marks of an aspirationally totalitarian regime is that it eliminates private laws. All private rights of property and contract, all jury trials and other institutions of adjudication, the family, any private sources of private authority that might compete with it. Over those, an unjust regime places its own arbitrary rules and judgments, which are not rationally related to the various goods of the people in their plural, plural communities. A just political community is therefore pluralist. It does not mistake expertise for practical wisdom, nor the ends of those in power for the common good. It preserves the primacy of private law and private ordering. It especially extends legal and constitutional protection to those institutions of ordering that make and enforce private laws and which enable different groups and communities to flourish within the community in different ways. But a just political community is not infinitely pluralist. Some acts are inherently wrongful because natural reason directly prohibits them. No political community can do without laws prohibiting murder, maiming, incitement, defamation, perjury, prostitution, and human trafficking, trespass and theft, and abandonment of spouses and children. A political regime that tolerates or encourages inherently wrongful acts is also an unjust and therefore illegitimate regime because it acts contrary to the reasons for its existence. An especially pernicious political regime goes wrong in both of these two ways. The worst regimes oppress institutions of private law and private ordering and destroy all the well-reasoned private rights that they create, while simultaneously refusing to vindicate public rights, allowing wrongdoers to tear at the fabric of society with impunity. This is how the rule of law is lost. Now, it goes without saying that we're losing the rule of law. The important question is, what caused us to devolve in this way? No doubt, many causes and villains led us here, but some particular villains deserve special opprobrium, and I intend to heap upon them the scorn and disdain that they so richly deserve. <laughs> Not only because it is fitting so to do, but also because we need to understand how we lost the rule of law if we're going to rebuild its foundations. The villains, you'll be happy to know, are American law professors. The speakers last evening were reticent to beat up on elites. Um, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm nothing if not a shameless demagogue. <laughs> the American law professors, though, modeled their villainy on that of an earlier English law professor, an especially creepy villain named Jeremy Bentham. Before his corpse was embalmed at his request and displayed as an icon at University College London, look it up, true story, Bentham spent his entire career expressly particularly uh, corrosive disdain for the rule of law. Law is nothing more nor less than sovereign power, he asserted. Any idea that law exists independent of the sovereign's will is not to be taken seriously. Bentham was not what one would call an intellectually humble man. Adumbrating the tactics of postmodern activists by more than a century, 
He mocked and derided anyone who clung to that old connection between the law of the just and the right. The idea of natural rights was to be dismissed as nonsense on stilts. The entire tradition of English common law could be swept aside as infantile. Customary law, he said, is the law of brutes. And do not make the sophomoric error of thinking that you have constitutional rights. What we call rights are mere concessions of privilege from the sovereign. They exist at the sovereign's forbearance and are entirely contingent upon his will. Bentham's theory laid the foundation for what became known as English legal positivism. In the early versions of legal positivism expressed by Bentham and his disciple John Austin, all law is the exercise of political power. Law is not something independent of sovereignty, nor does law justify and limit political power, as the American founders thought. Rather, law is entirely contingent upon the power of whoever manages to attain and keep the highest political office. Bentham defined law as an assemblage of signs indicating a volition conceived by the sovereign within the state to govern a person or class of persons under his power. These persons are in the habit of obeying the sovereign. And so the sovereign does not attempt to rule by appealing to the reason of his subjects. He does not communicate with his fellow human beings as rational divine image bearers. He simply expresses his will. He imposes his will on others by the brute fact of his sovereignty and by the unreasoned habituation of his subjects. The one limitation on the sovereign's power is his own fear. His fear that if he pushes his subjects too far too fast, they may awaken from their brutishness, rise up against him, and deprive him of his sovereignty. Now, Bentham and the positivists did not jettison reason entirely. It's not going away yet. On Bentham's view, law must remain intelligible to the extent that it is necessary to communicate the sovereign's volition. Law itself provides no reason for obedience, but to serve its functions, law must effectively communicate what the sovereign commands and prohibits. So in English legal positivism, law retains the grammar of language and the form of reason, even though all of the actual ends of the, of the law have dropped out. After Bentham, legal theory clung for several decades to the wispy vestiges of rationality, like empty snakeskins or corn husks, until even those were swept away. But that's a little bit later in our story. We have a couple more villains to heap opprobrium upon. The next chapter brings us to American soil, where we meet an American jurist by the name of Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Holmes put to pragmatic ends his considerable rhetorical ability, his influence as an associate justice, first on the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and then on the Supreme Court of the United States, and his proximity to elite law faculties. Holmes washed the rights and duties of the law in what he called cynical acid, and he began the gradual erosion of the vestiges of right and legal justice that the English legal positivists had left in place. In 1897, standing on the steps of Boston University's law school, Holmes delivered what was to become the most influential expression of American jurisprudence for the next century. The talk was published in the Harvard Law Review under the title, The Path of the Law. In that landmark work, as in an earlier work deceptively called The Common Law, Holmes fathered the novel myth that legal judgments are not uh, judgments of law, but are mere products of judicial power. And that the common law is therefore nothing more than the law made by judges. Holmes stripped the reason out of the common law and established a new sovereign hierarchy with judges on top. This is where we get our idea of judicial supremacy and why we now all wait around the last Monday of every June for the Supreme Court to tell us what the law is. A generation later, legal realists such as Carl Llewellyn, Felix Cohen, and Arthur Corbin made judicial supremacy the official dogma of elite American law schools. It really did start at the top and work its way down especially that law professor faculty called Harvard. And their disciples took these dogmas with them and they joined law faculties in flyover country. And it quickly displaced the older idea of law as a means to achieve the just and the right. In the several generations since their evangelistic diaspora, legal realists, law professors have indoctrinated generations of American lawyers to believe that all law is political power. So the only choice now is not between law as reason and law as power. The only choice is between having law made by a legislative sovereign, a judicial sovereign, 
or an executive sovereign. To this day, America's most influential lawyers remain enslaved to this dogma. Liberal lawyers think Justice Anthony Kennedy prefer judicial supremacy. Progressive lawyers think Justice Stephen Breyer prefer executive supremacy. Conservative lawyers think the late Justice Antonin Scalia prefer legislative supremacy. But they all think of law as essentially power. Until the last decade, these modern philosophies of law correlated quite exactly with broader philosophical commitments. Judicial supremacists were liberals. They viewed courts as guardians of civil liberties against the predations of tyrannical majoritarian factions. Southern Democrats made the liberal view plausible when they used legislatures to enact Jim Crow segregation. And Northern progressives did the same who used legislatures to enact eugenics laws. Administrative supremacists were progressives who believed in the omnicompetence of experts and credentialed statesmen. They believed that experts and statesmen could engineer society correctly if they could just rule from within administrative agencies where they would be insulated from populist pressures. The apparent triumphs of zoning regulations, a professional military and diplomatic corps, and public health officials made the progressive view plausible. Legislative supremacists were conservatives and libertarians. They viewed unaccountable courts and administrative agencies as the chief threats to ordered liberty and in institutions of civil society. They looked to constitutional and legal texts to supply limitations on judicial and executive powers. They developed old legal interpretive methods into new theories called originalism and textualism. And the judicial and executive usurpations which made their view plausible are too numerous to count here. We'd be here all night. Now recently, however, this correlation has fallen apart. All the modern legal theories turn out to be interchangeable with each other. Progressives, such as Yale Law Professor Jack Balkin, have discovered the charms of textual interpretation. They even have their own version, which Balkin calls living originalism. Libertarians, especially um, one at George Mason University, have fallen in love all over again with the so-called Lochner era of American jurisprudence, during which the US Supreme Court used judicial supremacy to strike down legislative enactments that burdened economic liberties. And reactionaries now celebrate the muscular efficacy of the administrative state. One in particular, a Harvard law professor, would substitute a neo-Aristotelian anthropology for a Darwinian one, but essentially shares progressives aversion to constitutional governance. Now that modern legal theories turned out to be fungible and interchangeable is, the only, is only a surprise to those who've only ever read modern legal theories. From the broader perspective of the Western jurisprudential tradition, stretching 1400 years from Justinian to Robert Jackson, the difference between legislative, judicial, and executive supremacy are not nearly as important and interesting as what they all have in common. They all treat law as essentially the exercise of power. Now, I do not mean that there are no important differences. If law is just power, then it matters a lot who has it. But at the end of the day, it only matters to the extent that some official somewhere believes that law is not merely power that he or she is obligated to obey duties which precede his office, that at least some law is independent of and prior to the diktats of public officials, and that law rests upon and expresses reasons for acting together in political community. And so all of these theories are parasitic. The difference also matters, however, because some modern legal theories are truly more compatible with the rule of law than others. Constitutional originalism, at least in some versions, conceives of the text of the Constitution the way that earlier jurists conceived of independent legal reasons. But again, this is contingent upon having good texts and not having bad ones. And so at bottom, all of America's now dominant jurisprudential schools are either parasitic upon or destructive of the rule of law. As Harvard law professor Joseph Singer boasted, we are all legal realists now. The law professors did this. The legal realists attained complete preeminence in American legal education, pushing the classical jurisprudence of Justinian, Hale, and Blackstone out of the curriculum. They even spawned progeny, the law and economics movement, whose proponents took seriously Holmes's call for a scientific jurisprudence. Practitioners of the economic analysis of law adhere to the principle that all laws can be explained as calculated means 
to reduce inefficiencies resulting from information costs and other limitations of human knowledge. Economics explains everything, the family, crime, even charity. And what if it doesn't? Yeah, no problem. Economic analysis of the law can simply stipulate that whatever phenomenon it examines is the revealed preference of some identifiable group of people. Business owners happen to prefer selling things. Thieves happen to prefer selling, uh, stealing things. Religious people happen to prefer giving things away. The job of the law is to tally up the costs of these various activities and arrange everyone's entitlements so that the costs do not outrun overall preference satisfaction. Now, at this point in the development of American jurisprudence, if development is the right word, another faction splintered off from American legal realism. Led by another elite American law professor, Harvard professor Duncan Kennedy, the critical legal studies movement accepted the most basic dogma of legal realism that law is just power. But they took this dogma even more seriously than the legal realists did. If law is merely power, then there is no reason to prefer political power to economic power or economic power to other kinds of human inequality. Political sovereignty is artificial, after all, and if the artifices simply anneal the privileges of the privileged, then the entire edifice of supposedly neutral legal rules must come down from its pillared temple and face critical deconstruction. And so the next evolution in American jurisprudence came very quickly and took some people by surprise. The critical legal studies movement precipitated an avalanche of compounding critical theories whose ambition is to deconstruct law altogether and to replace it with power contests between different classes of persons and arbitrary identity groupings. The critical theorists are now busy sweeping away the husks of instrumental reason that the English legal positivists and American legal realists left dangling arbitrarily from the stipulations of constitutional governance. Early in the critical deconstruction of law, in an unfortunately overlooked talk at an American law school, one of the fathers of critical theory, the French post-structuralist Jacques Derrida, said simply and expressly what all the modern and postmodern theorists have been driving at, but that none prior to Derrida had had the courage or the candor to place on the table for examination. He asserted two propositions. First, Derrida stated that law is nothing more than, quote, a force that justifies itself. There is no such thing as a law without coercive enforcement, he said. Reason does not justify the law, force does. As another theorist explained, in Derrida's theory, all law is based on violence, inasmuch as there is no original law, but rather all law was instituted at some time. Second, Derrida insisted that law is not justice. This is precisely a reversal of Justinian. Justice is, quote, the experience that we are not able to experience, an experience of the impossible. This dogma forever divorces law from legal justice. Indeed, it places it in an entirely different mode than the just and the right. Justice is always particular and subjective. It requires addressing oneself to the other in the language of the other whereas law is always universal and presumes objectivity. So on this view, to speak of law in connection with justice is not only false, but incoherent. The concept of legal justice is a category mistake, like asking whether the ocean is bluer than the Empire State Building is tall. The rule of law requires us to exercise practical reason and to communicate our reasoned laws using a common language which for lawyers consists of legal terms of art. Critical theories destroy the possibility of both a common reason and a common language, and so destroy the two necessary predicates for the rule of law. But in this, as in so much else, critical theorists are merely continuing the project begun by the modern legal theorists. Here's the really bad news, if that wasn't bad enough. If you're waiting for conservative lawyers to ride in and save you from this, you're gonna be waiting a long time. Many, though certainly not all, originalists today are either positivists who accept legislative supremacy or legal realists who accept judicial supremacy. Their theories are different only in degree, not in kind from critical theories. Critical theories are the logical outgrowths of legal positivism and legal realism, 
And we must keep this truth squarely before our eyes. If law is nothing more than sovereign power, and if sovereign power is a brute fact, then there is no reason to prefer sovereign political power over cultural, social, or economic power. The critical theorists are surely correct about this. If human law is not grounded on reasonable customs and conventions, and if those conventions are not grounded in natural and divine law, then the critical theorists are correct about liberal legal regimes. Liberal legalism is by itself arbitrary. Worse, it is very likely a dishonest facade used to cover inequalities of cultural and economic power. So to accept any kind of legal positivism or legal realism is in principle to accept all the critical legal theories that they spawned. It is to accept thus the destructive demons that postmodernism is now unleashing in our legal institutions. Critical theories take modern legal theories to their logical extremes. So we cannot have post-structuralism and its critical theory offspring and have the rule of law. We must choose one or the other. But the sobering lesson for the textualists of the Federalist Society and the liberals at the ACLU and the faculty lounge is this, that modern theories are not our way out. They're equally as incompatible with the rule of law as critical theories are. So what is the way forward? To adapt C.S. Lewis, we must now find ourselves quite far along the wrong road. Progress requires first walking back to where we got off course. We must restore a law school curriculum that centers around jurists such as Justinian and Blackstone. We must begin with the study of law as a corpus of practical reasons. Now, fortunately, we do not have to look far. We're fortunate to work within a jurisprudential tradition, the common law tradition, and to be governed by a constitution that took the best customary laws, such as trusts and jury trials and the presumption of innocence, and combined them with the best natural laws, such as the rights to life and property. Our laws are still essentially rational. This is why, by the way, it had to come from the elite law schools. The law faculties like where I teach, where we're teaching practitioners, are just too practical to be able to get away with this nonsense. Uh, the hope here and the opportunity is that in the last two terms, the Supreme Court of the United States has returned to its so-called history and tradition test for discerning un, uh, unenumerated rights and the boundaries of those rights in the Constitution. This is an opportunity because it gives lawyers a pragmatic motivation to examine the historical concepts of laws which reveal the natural uh, insights about natural reason, justice, and the right. If you're now going to make an argument at the Supreme Court, doesn't matter what your ideology is, you better go back and read your Blackstone. When you do, you might find that he's not quite as racist as you thought. <laughs> restoring the law to its place within practical reason is like restoring a madman to his right mind. It does not by itself restore all that he has destroyed. But it does stop him from taking direction from Holmes and Foucault and Derrida. That's something, and it reveals the image of God within him. And I think we owe it to him to do that as a matter of justice. Thank you. Adam, thank you so much. Um, we're running a, a little bit late, and so I, I think we're, Adam is going to be on the stage tomorrow uh, for our panel. So I'm going to um, ask Father Wilbur to come up and give our closing prayer, and then uh, after this, we hope to see you over at the La Quinta again tonight. Brief reading for evening begins with a crisis. Two men were talking with each other, and they had 
someone who joined them who they did not recognize. And they said, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Besides all this, today, on the third day, since these things happened, yes, and certain women of our company who had arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found, found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. When they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it and broken it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew not, they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened to us the scriptures, so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and said, The Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Please stand as we pray together and as we sing. O Lord, We have learned so many things that say it is getting dark. And our hearts cry out, but we had hoped. And how often we have someone with us whom we do not really recognize. And so tonight we pray that as we come to the end of this day and the darkness has descended until the morning, that we too would recognize that in our crisis, he is with us. Abide with me, fast falls thee. Tide, the darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide, when other helpers fail and comforts flee. Help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. I need thy presence every passing hour. What but thy grace can foil the tempter's power? Who like thyself my stride and strength can be? Through cloud and sunshine, oh, 
abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In death, in death, O Lord, abide with me. Amen.